Hi, welcome to our session on automating the modernization of VM-based applications to containers. My name is Jason DeLorme and I'm joined by my peer, Mike Coleman. There's three areas of modernization that you can consider when moving applications to the cloud. The first is infrastructure modernization. And when we think about this on the axis of complexity and value, infrastructure modernization is by far the easiest step. As you graduate through this scale, complexity increases with changing code and building cloud native applications, all the way up to process automation, moving and adopting cloud native technologies also requires how uh, optimizing DevOps practices and um, optimizing your people and processes. So really to land those first few workloads, we're gonna to talk to you today about infrastructure modernization and some of the options that you have here. Often customers go through an application rationalization exercise in order to determine which applications to move to the cloud in which order. So the first category of applications often called legacy applications and, and sometimes even referred to as monolith applications that you know, all of the functionality is into a single binary or, or one complicated application. And monoliths aren't always a bad thing, but when they're VM-based and potentially they take a long time to start, they load logs, they load cache, they um, you know, don't necessarily lend themselves to being able to be replicated into multiple instances, we think of these traditionally as not ready for cloud native. However, they can be rehosted into infrastructure VMs. So moving from on-prem VMs into a VM in infrastructure as a service, for example. The other option is to start thinking about maybe decomposing that monolith and reimagining it and refactoring to cloud native services. The second area are what we might think of as container ready. And this actually might be bigger than you think. The options here, you can clearly rehost these applications into an IaaS based approach with VMs, or you could replatform them to something like Kubernetes and put them in a container and have them orchestrated. This is really going to be the focus of our talk here today. You know, as you think about some of these others, uh, container um, uh, cloud compatible or cloud friendly or cloud native applications that might already be in containers, those are certainly candidates. We'll dive into number two today. So what are containers? You know, if you've been uh, under a rock for the last, um, you know, five, six, seven years, <laughs> um, then you've probably never heard the term container. And ultimately, they're a method for packaging up an application and all of its dependencies. You know, the most common phrase that you hear related to containers is it works on my machine, hence it will work in the cloud, it will work on somebody else's machine. And we often get away from some of those, you know, mysterious dependency issues or configuration issues that weren't necessarily there when you ran it on your laptop in dev, for example. Other phrases that we hear often uh, associated with containers, things like being lightweight, because it doesn't take the entire operating system, it's just your application and all the dependencies, it becomes more portable, it's using a standardized format that can be used, it helps increase productivity, and ultimately helps drive security as well. So why do we do this? Why do we build containers? If you think of a traditional VM-based application, Often choices were made to put an application per VM inside of the customer's infrastructure because of that bleeding over of dependencies. Maybe one application leverages a shared library that can get overwritten and that can create havoc for the other application. We ultimately optimize those applications for the minimum VM constraints for the operating system, a certain amount of memory, a certain amount of CPU and disk, not based on the application's requirements itself. So we often see underutilized hardware being leveraged and also a complicated rollout process for every single VM because every single app has its own VM. If we can move to a place where applications can coexist and not step on each other and not conflict with each other in a single VM, we can get to a place where we're optimizing the infrastructure, optimizing even the licensing costs since often the operating system is licensed at the VM and not at the container, if I can get two applications into a single VM, I've halved my licensing costs for that. Or I can get to high availability easier with the same licensing costs because I can have two instances of this application running. Each VM now has two instances here. So 
I mentioned the, the, the container-based approach. You can use containers for Windows or Linux machines. Now, Windows is a little bit more recent when it comes to adopting containerized strategies. For that reason, there are a few different behaviors versus Linux, which it was built from the beginning to uh, support containers. There are a handful of things that you need to think about when moving to a containerized environment in an orchestrator like Kubernetes. Specifically, some of those um, Windows containers don't support privilege pods. That means those things like virus scanning software really live at the VM level. They don't live inside the container itself. Those types of services need to be examined. Anything that has low level network dependencies where it's dependent on something you know, below layer seven, the networking stack, for example, you don't necessarily want to, to, to depend on the IP address of another machine or joining a cluster where there's a heartbeat in between and they need to know a static IP address can be a little bit problem, problematic when you're when you thinking about IPs and we can talk about ways of uh, addressing that. You know, if there's low level GPU or TPU support, this isn't available in a Windows container yet. Cloud native features like Istio to create a service mesh in order to uh, help with, with, uh, with traffic management and service discovery. This isn't supported in Windows containers just yet, uh, nor is being able to use uh, something like Cloud Run or Knative, the open source version, where you can scale to zero in a serverless environment, not quite ready for Windows containers. So let's talk about what is ready and what are the ideal container candidates. So, First off, I would look at your web applications, your web and logic tiers, you know, things that maybe they're written in Python, PHP, Java, .NET, ASP.NET, for example, those things hosted in IIS. Those are great candidates potentially to run inside of a container in a, in a container orchestrated environment like Kubernetes. Um, another area to look at is batch jobs or console applications that maybe run spiky workloads, um, things that run maybe uh, you know, every day at 6 p.m. or things that run and listen to queues. They don't have any kind of, kind of uh, GUI to them. Um, they're, they're an ideal candidate. Even Windows services, those are applications that are registered with the Windows operating system to begin at startup, for example. They may even log to the Windows application event log. All these things can be containerized and run in a container orchestrator. Now, let me jump to the lower right-hand side of this and talk about those container workloads that are potentially unsuitable. And I'm going to start right away. I mentioned GUI, the graphical user interface. Anything that has a GUI is not going to be a good candidate for a container. You can't run a remote desktop protocol session, for example, into a container. So, you know, virtualized desktop infrastructure, VDI, for example, is not a fit for containers. If the application that you're using um, is primarily centered around user interaction through a Win32 console, for example. That is not something that's going to run inside of a container. Now, there's a gray area of things that you may want to investigate further and use a fit assessment tool, for example, to determine whether it's appropriate for running in a container. Things on the Linux side where there's a GPU or TPU dependency, um, areas where the container requires elevated privileges. Another big category here is commercial off-the-shelf uh, off software, or COTS. Now, most ISVs have come out with newer versions of their applications that are containerized already. So it's often a good fit to think about maybe a version upgrade that will, will take you to their container-based approach. However, there are a lot of applications where maybe the vendor is no longer in business, or maybe it's critical to the business, but you know, nobody really knows what the application was written in. You just have the binaries. They don't have access to the source code. They could be a fit. However, we should run an assessment tool here in order to determine whether or not it will work well in a containerized environment. And with that, I'd like to introduce my peer, Mike Coleman, who can talk to you about a solution that we have at Google to help you with this. Mike? Thanks, Jason. I want to talk to you today about a tool called Migrate for Anthos and GKE. We built this tool to help automate the migration of virtual machine-based workloads from environments like Amazon, uh, AWS, uh, VMware, Azure, and even Google Cloud Compute Engine. This tool will automatically inspect those container, those virtual machines, excuse me, and convert them to containers where then you can start taking advantage of some of the benefits that Jason mentioned previously. Things like uh, improved resource utilization, uh, unified logging and monitoring, and then potentially day two operations. 
So it's one thing to talk about a tool. It's another thing to actually show it. So I want to do a quick demo where I'm going to take you through a payment service based uh, virtual machine migration. So I have an online boutique and online shopping and a bunch of the services are already running in containers. So think of the front end, the shopping cart, some of those services. They call back to a payment service that's running in a virtual machine on Google Cloud. We're going to migrate that VM into a container and integrate it with the rest of the application. We'll start with the fit assessment. As Jason mentioned, it's critical to understand how well your VM-based workload can run in a container. From there, we're gonna create a migration plan. We'll make a few tweaks to that. We'll run the migration. We'll get a set of deployment artifacts. We'll deploy those. And then finally, we'll edit the uh, service discovery so that it's not looking for the virtual machine, but rather the payment service running as a Kubernetes service. This is the VM that we're going to migrate today into a container running on Kubernetes. So let's go ahead. I'm going to go up here and close this down because we don't need it anymore. And let's take a look at this application actually running. So if I come over here and I click on one of the products, the antique camera, I click add to cart and then I click place order. Everything's working as expected. That order was processed using the payment service on the virtual machine. So the first thing we need to do to get this all working though is to stop the payment service VM. A virtual machine can't be migrated until it's stopped. With the VM stopped, let's go ahead and clear the screen and close out a cloud shell. Now let's take a look at the migration fit assessment. I've created a report by running an agent on the virtual machine and it's stored here in this JSON file. I can upload this into Cloud Console and it's gonna give me an indication that my application is a good fit for migration. If I wanna drill down, I can click on the name and get a list of all the different things that were inspected. We know that we're good to go here, so why don't we go ahead and close out of this and actually start the migration. I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna click on Migrations and I'm gonna click Create Migration. I'm gonna give my migration a name. I'm gonna call it Online Boutique Migration. We'll choose our source. The instance name was Payment Service VM and we're gonna just do the image. So let's create the migration. In the interest of time, I've sped this up so we can move on to our next step, which is to review and edit the migration plan. So the migration plan comes up and the first thing I wanna do is add an annotation to tell Migrate for GKE to create an image that can run on an autopilot cluster. I also wanna go and adjust the image name and the Kubernetes service name and deployment name to payment service instead of payment service VM since we're not running in a VM any longer. So this takes a few minutes. I've sped the video up. I'll rejoin you when it's finished. With the process completed, let's take a look at the artifacts that were created. So I've come down here under next steps. I click options and review artifacts, and that will bring up a list of what was created for us. The first thing you'll see are a couple of Docker images, one that we'll actually deploy and that one we can use for day two operations. We also get a Docker file and a Kubernetes deployment spec. So if I open up Cloud Shell, you'll see that I've already downloaded these files. So I'll do an LS here, you can see all the files. Now this Kubernetes deployment spec.yaml is going to create a new Kubernetes deployment and it's gonna create a new Kubernetes service for our migrated workload. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's make sure everything's started. We'll take a look at the service and there it is running. And let's take a look at the pod and it's running as well. So what we're gonna do now is check on our application. Now, actually, I expect this to fail. So let's come in here, let's click on the typewriter, and let's go ahead and add that to our cart and check out. So it's in our cart, place order. Now, what happened is it's trying to reach the payment service on the DNS name of the VM. So what we need to do is actually modify the deployment spec for our application. And we need to change it from looking at the internal DNS name of the VM to the Kubernetes service name. So that's payment service. So we'll chop off the DNS name here and just leave payment service. We'll save that out. And then we can go back in and rerun that deployment YAML and that's gonna reprovision our services. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll do a kubectl apply and apply that updated boutique deployment.yaml. It'll reconfigure the services. So let's go ahead and clear the screen here. Let's look at the pods. It looks like uh, the checkout service has been reconfigured and is running. So if I come in here and I ch click on the typewriter and I add it to cart and I place order, everything is working as expected. We've successfully migrated our payment service from a virtual machine into a container running on a GKE autopilot cluster using Migrate for GKE.
So that's the demo and demos are great. They give you a feel for the product. You can see some of the things in action, but it's important also to look at how the tool is used in the real world. So I wanna start by discussing a customer example. This is the Telegraph. They're a content management, content publication service over in the UK. And they had a legacy content management system that they were running. It was super important to their business, but it was a little difficult for them to manually migrate it into containers. So they used Migrate for Anthos to do that work for them. Uh, vastly simplified the process and they're already realizing savings, not just on the infrastructure, as Jason mentioned before, with the bin packing and whatnot, but also in the day-to-day -day operation of that CMS. So that's one customer, that's one example. Now, what about yourself? Now, if you're gonna look at migrating, there's some things I want you to consider. Um, these are six items. They're not insurmountable by any stretch of the imagination. They're really presented here just as a, uh, things for you to be aware of. And the first we saw in the demo, we were using VM-based DNS hostname discovery, right? So we had the DNS name of that payment service. We converted that to a Kubernetes service. So we let Kubernetes take care of that service discovery using its own internal DNS structure. Um, along the same lines, if you have host files that you've customized and you've got host, file, uh, host names, you can use host aliases in the pod spec to take care of that. So that's another simple migration. Again, looking at the pod YAML, a couple other things we could take care of are file shares. So file shares are great. You can use them. We just don't automatically migrate them for you. You're going to need to define uh, NFS persistent volumes inside of the pod spec to take care of those. Um, and the same with environment variables. Uh, you may be using an environment variable for the uh, URI for your database, for instance. Um, you can actually define that same environment variable in the pod spec, and then you don't need to change any other applications because you're getting the same information you're expecting. So define the environment variable uh, in the pod YAML, and that'll take care of that. Now, I wanna say something, uh, and I might say kind of forcefully, but I, because I really believe it, just because you're migrating something to a container doesn't mean that you don't have to understand how it works and how it runs. As a matter of fact, if you want to have a successful migration, it's critical that you understand what you have and how it works. When you go in and you look at a migration, you should be looking at the services and the agents that are running in that VM and make a conscious decision on whether or not you need them in your container. For instance, uh, you may have an agent running that's doing logging and monitoring. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit in the next bullet point, but you probably want to disable that. Um, you also want to make sure you're running at the right run level. So go through, audit those services, disable the ones you don't need. Um, that will help minimize container image size and improve performance and it'll reduce complexity. So this is a really important one uh, that I want you to go through. The other thing that it's not specifically called out here along the same uh, vein, file system structure. Right? Are there directories um, and files that you don't need in the resulting image? Right? You can, you can uh, tell Migrate for Anthos and Migrate for GKE to not include certain directories, certain files. Again, smaller image size, better performance. And then finally, I alluded to, uh, alluded to it, um, application logging. We integrate Migrate for Anthos and Migrate for GKE with the migrate the cloud Google Cloud metrics logging and monitoring services. So you don't actually need to have those agents. You don't need to do that work in the container. We'll just pick that stuff up for you and you can monitor it in Cloud Console um, right there within Google Cloud. So that's what we have for you today. I really want to thank you for tuning in on behalf of myself and Jason. Uh, why don't you go out, uh, have a great rest of your day and, and look at migrating some of those VM workloads.